Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, this seminar. And I hope you can all hear me well. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, all people who are working with me on this project. Uh, they are listed on this uh, slide. And as Matthew uh, mentioned, that I'll be talking about interannual variability of sea level and heat content in the South Indian Ocean. So um, first of all, the seminar is based on two uh, recent publications and the latest came out uh, earlier this year, and it was led by Marion Kersal, who was a postdoc at AML. And before I start, I'd, I'd like to start with a simple definition, actually. So because in this research, we are interested in regional sea level changes. So throughout this presentation, I will be using the term dynamic sea level anomaly. So the dynamic sea level anomaly is defined as uh, the sea level anomaly with the global mean sea level subtracted. So basically, we are looking at regional sea level changes not uh, related to the global mean sea level rise. Um, so in this figure, you can see the dynamic sea level trends in, 2000, uh, in 1993 to 2021. And as the global mean sea level is rising at a rate of about 3.5 millimeters per year, uh, regional dynamic sea level changes are due to ocean and atmospheric uh, dynamics and there are regions with accelerated sea level rise and the Indian Ocean is one of them. So in, in earlier studies uh, the South Indian Ocean outlined here by the red rectangle um, was characterized as uh, one of the major heat accumulators and regions for accelerated sea level rise among oceanic basins. And this was uh, mainly due to the decade-long increase uh, of sea level and oceanic heat content that occurred in 2004 to 2013. That you can see in uh, uh, this map that shows dynamic sea level trends over this time interval. In the right plot, I'm showing sea level averaged over the orange box in the South Indian Ocean. Uh, shown in the map, and you can see that the decade-long sea level rise uh, in 2004 to 2014 that reached its maximum value in 2014, and uh, uh, sea level anomaly in this year, in 2014, shows uh, a basin a uh, wide increase uh, between uh, between 10 and 30 uh, degrees uh, south. So what is interesting is that this, this sea level rise ended abruptly uh, with a rapid decrease uh, that reached a minimum value in 2016. And during the following two years, the sea level partly recovered. However, note that uh, uh, this recovery was mainly, mainly occurred in the, in the western part of the, of the basin, namely to the west of uh, 90 East Ridge, which is located at around 90 degrees uh, east. Uh, while the negative sea level anomalies were still um, prevalent in the, in the western uh, part of the basin. So I should mention that in the following, I will be often referring to uh, the western and eastern parts of the South Indian Ocean, meaning that these parts are separated by uh, the 90 East Ridge. So the red curve in the right plot is the thermostatic sea level anomaly computed from Argo temperature profiles, and which is equivalent to the upper ocean heat content. So the increase of sea level in 2004 to 2013, and then a decrease in the following two years, were mostly due to the upper ocean warming and cooling respectively. So this decade-long heat accumulation in 2004 to 2013, and then the rapid heat release were the main motivation for this study. So furthermore, uh, changes in sea level and heat content in, in the basin are also related to El Nino southern oscillation. Specifically, uh, the decade-long increase of sea level occurred during the period uh, of prevailing La Nina uh, conditions, uh, when warm waters were accumulating in the western part of equatorial Pacific. The abrupt drop of sea level in 2014 to 2015 
followed the onset of a particularly strong uh, El Nino event in 2014-2016, when the warm water accumulated in the western equatorial Pacific streamed uh, eastward. What is interesting is that the oceanic response in, in the South Indian Ocean to the strongest on record El Nino events, first in 1997 and then 2014-2016, uh, was different. So there was no similar, uh, similar basin-wide decrease of sea level and ocean heat content after the 1997, as it happened during, after, during the most recent year. So changes in the regional oceanic heat content are caused by uh, ASC heat exchange uh, and by heat advection that is due to atmospheric and ocean dynamics. So let's first uh, review what atmospheric and oceanic processes can be responsible for the observed sea level anomalies and upper ocean heat content changes in, in the South Indian Ocean. Um, atmospheric circulation in the South Indian Ocean is governed by southeasterly trade winds, and local changes in wind stress curve influencing the upper ocean heat content in, in the basin are related to ENSO by means of atmospheric teleconnections uh, via the Volcker uh, circulation. And this is the so-called atmospheric bridge effect. There is also the Indian Ocean dipole, uh, which is an irregular oscillation of sea surface temperatures in which the western equatorial Indian Ocean um, becomes alternately warmer during positive IOD phase and, and then colder during negative uh, IOD phase than the eastern equatorial part of the, of the ocean. And then there is also Antarctic oscillation or the southern annular mode, which is a, a low frequency atmospheric um, variability of the southern hemisphere um, that determines the strength of westerly winds over, over the southern ocean. So uh, trade winds, trade winds in the Pacific set up the Indo-Pacific sea level uh, gradient that drives the Indonesian through flow for the ITF. Uh, the ITF is the main uh, conduit of warm waters from the Pacific to the South Indian Ocean, and it is generally stronger during La Nina and weaker during El Nino conditions. So the major part of the ITF waters uh, is carried westward by uh, the southeast, uh, southern equatorial current, and eventually enters uh, the Atlantic Ocean why the Gulas leakage and rings. <clears throat> At the eastern boundary of the South Indian Ocean, the meridional pressure gradient set up by the ITF uh, drives, drives uh, the, the warm near surface Leeuwin current over here along the coast of West Australia. And besides, uh, besides the advection by the ITF, signals generated in the Pacific uh, can enter the South Indian Ocean as coastal attract uh, waves and propagate along the coast of Western Australia. And then uh, there are Aegis and Rossby waves that propagate westward and contribute to the redistribution of heat from the eastern boundary to the ocean interior. All right, so uh, given what I just listed in this not so short uh, introduction, uh, the objectives of uh, uh, this research were first to investigate the interplay between the remote, which, uh, the remote and local drivers of the interannual to decadal sea level and ocean heat content variability and assess their relative uh, contributions. So by remote drivers, I mean those of Pacific origin that, uh, that is signals coming into the South Indian Ocean uh, by the idea. Local drivers are mainly directly or indirectly related to uh, local reinforcement. So second, uh, we aim to investigate the mechanisms responsible for the abrupt uh, cooling in the South Indian Ocean in 2014 to 2016, and for the subsequent uh, heat content recovery in 2017, 2018. And finally, we wanted to characterize the differences in oceanic and atmospheric conditions during the two uh, strongest 
on record in New York events in 1987-98 and in 2014-2016. Okay, so here I am showing the time longitude diagram of uh, the low pass filtered sea level anomaly average between 10 and 30 south. So we can see that the west for propagation is the most prominent feature of year-to-year -year sea level anomaly changes. And this plot uh, shows that uh, sea level anomaly time series averaged in the eastern part of the basin. And uh, in the left, you see the uh, sea level anomaly time series averaged in the, in the western part of the basin. And I'm also showing here the time series of static shown by the blue curves, um, uh, thermostatic, the red curves, and halostatic green curves, uh, sea level anomalies, and also multivariate answer index uh, showing by blue and pink uh, shading. So uh, you can see that in both the western and eastern parts of the basin, the interannual variability of sea level is mostly static in nature and in, in thermostatic, which again confirms that sea level anomaly is a good proxy for shining heat content changes in, in, in this region. So we can also uh, see that sea level anomaly changes in the eastern part of the basin are well correlated with ENSO, so that these changes largely represent uh, ocean, uh, ocean tunnel effect. All right, so not all signals uh, radiated from eastern boundary are able to cross the entire uh, South Indian Ocean. And for example, uh, westward propagation does not explain some uh, anomalies to the west of uh, the 90 East Ridge, uh, namely uh, warm anomalies in uh, 1995, uh, 2005 to 2008, and 2017 to 2019, cold anomalies in 2011, 2014 and then in 2016, and amplification of cold anomaly in uh, uh, 1997 and also after 2000. As I have already mentioned in the introduction, on annual average, the low atmospheric circulation over the South Indian Ocean is dominated by uh, southeasterly trade winds, which are part of, uh, of the large scale uh, anticyclonic circulation. Uh, the Associated positive wind stress fuel uh, drives Ekman downwelling, uh, so which means a negative Ekman pumping, and leads to downward doming isotherms centered uh, at around 20 degrees south. So therefore, uh, cyclonic, cyclonic or clockwise, because we're in the southern hemisphere, and anticyclonic or anticlockwise anomalies in the South Indian Ocean lead to the upper ocean cooling and warming respect. So the regression of wind and Ekman pumping anomalies on the ENSO index shows that El Nino events when ENSO index is positive are associated with weaker trade winds um, in, in the South Indian Ocean and uh, easterly wind anomalies uh, along the equator. Uh, the atmospheric circulation pattern favors, this atmospheric circulation pattern favors uh, um, so uh, so it favors uh, so it favors negative Ekman uh, pumping anomaly in the northeastern uh, South Indian Ocean and positive Ekman uh, pumping anomaly in the southwestern Indian Ocean. So this leads to the upper ocean warming here and cooling here respectively. And the opposite occurs during La Nina events. So the regression of wind and Ekman pumping anomalies on the uh, dipole uh, mode index, which characterizes the IOD, uh, shows uh, that easterly equatorial wind anomalies lead to the upper ocean warming between 15 south and 15 north um, during a positive IOD phase and vice versa during a negative IOD phase. And there is a rather small small response in the subtropical, um, subtropical, subtropical part of the South Indian Ocean. Okay, so a comparison of uh, 
atmospheric circulation patterns during the two strongest El Nino events in 1987-1998 and 2014-2016 uh, provides an explanation why the basin-wide oceanic response uh, to the former was much weaker than to the latter. And the two main uh, differences between these two time periods were the presence of strong easterly equatorial winds in 1997-1998, uh, which was not observed in 2014-2016. Uh, and uh, the presence of basin-wide cyclonic wind anomaly in 2014-2016, which was not found uh, during the uh, El Nino event in 1997. So it should be noted that uh, the 1997-98 El Nino happened in phase with a strong positive uh, IOD, which led to an amplification, uh, amplification of easterly uh, wind anomalies in the, um, around, around the equator, inhibiting the formation the formation of a cyclonic wind anomaly in the subtropical uh, South Indian Ocean. Uh, strong equatorial uh, uh, easterlies in 1997-98 generated downward, uh, downward Ekman pumping anomalies and favored dark ocean warming around the equator, uh, apparently compensating for the El Nino generated uh, cooling um, in, in the eastern part of, of the basin from the ocean tunnel effect. So on the other hand, a particularly strong negative IOD event occurred in 2016, uh, which is probably responsible for the weak equatorial wind anomalies um, in 2004-2016, which favored the formation of a basin-wide cyclonic wind anomaly during this time period. Uh, and this anomaly led to the upper ocean cooling, which complemented the cooling in the eastern uh, South Indian Ocean due to ocean tunnel effect. So it's also interesting to analyze uh, uh, the La Nina conditions that followed after these two strongest on record El Nino events. And you can see that in 1998-2001, uh, westerly, uh, wind anomalies associated with a strong La Nina developed along the equator and uh, uh, trade winds over the South Indian Ocean uh, strengthened and shifted, uh, uh, shifted westward, leading to the upper ocean cooling in the northern north eastern uh, part of the basin and warming in the south and south western part of the basin. In 2017-2018, uh, southeasterly trade winds strengthened, leading to the downward Ekman pumping anomalies over most of, of, of the South Indian Ocean, um, while equatorward wind anomalies were relatively weak, um, as the IOD during this period was uh, switching from a negative to a strongly positive phase. Uh, so in the following, I will quantitatively and uh, quantitatively demonstrate that this change in the surface atmospheric circulation of the South Indian Ocean uh, was largely responsible for the observed recovery of heat content in 2016-2018, right after the uh, most recent uh, El Nino. So um, while detailed investigation of how the regional climate modes affect the variability of sea level and ocean heat content in the South Indian Ocean is beyond the scope of this uh, uh, study. Uh, here I am only showing you the statistical relationship between the local wind portion and ENSO IOD and Southern Annular Mode or SAM. Uh, statistically significant negative uh, correlation coefficients between the Ekman pumping anomaly shown here um, so the, these anomalies are averaged over 10 south to 30 south, and here I'm also showing the ANSO index, so the multivariate ANSO index. So there is statistically significant negative correlation to the east of uh, 90 east reach. Uh, so the observed differences in local wind forcing during uh, the two strongest El Nino events 
actually challenge the effectiveness of the atmospheric bridge. However, the atmospheric bridge was apparently efficient during the uh, strong um, during the strong La Nina conditions in 1999 to 2001 and 2010 to 2012. So uh, what is also important to note here from, uh, from this is that uh, the wind driven upper ocean warming in the eastern South Indian Ocean during El Nino partly balances cooling anomalies advected from the Pacific Ocean via the ocean tunnel and vice versa during La Nina conditions. So now you see the comparison between uh, the Ekman uh, pumping anomalies and uh, uh, GMI index. So you see that there is also significant negative correlation between uh, Ekman pumping and GMI in the Eastern uh, uh, South Indian Ocean. And this is because the IOG related equatorial winds directly contribute to Ekman uh, pumping anomalies in the eastern uh, part of the basin. Uh, so that easterly equatorial winds uh, during a positive IOG phase are associated with downward Ekman pumping anomalies, uh, which means upper ocean warming and vice versa during a negative IOG phase uh, that leads to, to the cooling. There is also significant positive correlation between Ekman pumping anomalies um, and SAM in the Eastern South Indian, Ocean, South Indian Ocean. And this is because the stronger westerly winds over the Southern Ocean are usually associated with stronger trade winds over the South Indian Ocean. And this leads to divergence and top ocean cooling in the Eastern part of, uh, of the South Indian Ocean and vice versa when westerly and trade winds uh, become weaker. So uh, these relationships that are statistical relationships that I just demonstrated, they show that in the Western part of the South Indian Ocean, none of the regional climate nodes um, explains the full complexity of local uh, wind variability. So as I demonstrated in the previous slides, uh, wind stress curl anomalies in 2004 to 2018 were consistent with a strong reduction of the upper ocean heat content in 2014-2016 and then a quick recovery in 2017-2018. And it's instructive to analyze how the upper ocean temperature uh, structure um, observed by Argo floats was changing the depth and latitude over these uh, time intervals. So in the left plot, the contours, the contours uh, show profiles of potential temperature averaged between 55 east uh, to 110 east in 2016. These are solid blue con contours. Let's see if you can see them. And um, the dotted blue contours show uh, the profiles of potential temperature in 2014, and the color shading shows the difference between them. So contours in the, in the middle plot are for 2018 and 2016, and color shading again shows the difference between them. So the right plot, the right plot shows the difference between the respective profiles averaged between uh, 10 and 30 south. So what you can see that in 2000, 14 to 2016, the upper thousand meters of the subtropical South Indian Ocean experienced rather strong uh, cooling south of uh, 10 degrees south with a maximum temperature reduction of up to 0 0.8 approximately, um, observed at about 300 meters depth below the Ekman layer. And at the same time, temperature increased by more than one degree in the upper 200 meters to the north of 10 degrees south. These changes are consistent with the wind-driven divergence and upward Ekman pumping anomaly uh, to the north of, uh, um, so upward Ekman pumping between 10 and 30 south and wind-driven uh, wind convergence and downward Ekman pumping to the north of 10 degrees south. 
So during the recovery period, uh, the, the recovery of heat content and sea level in 2017-2018, temperature increased in the upper in, in the upper thousand meters south of uh, 10 degrees south, uh, with a maximum warming of up to 0 0.7 degree uh, between about 100 and 300 uh, meters depth. And this is consistent with anticyclonic wind anomaly and downward Ekman pumping in the subtropical uh, southern Indian So temperature changes during this time interval were associated with uh, uh, both the vertical and meridional uh, displacements of isotherms. Uh, the meridional Ekman transport anomalies appear to uh, have a small a minor impact on temperature changes in, in the upper 50 meters. On the other hand, uh, as we see, uh, wind stress field or drive segment pump and affected the entire upper 1,000 meters water column by raising the isotherms in 2014, 2016, and deepening them in, uh, in the following two years. Okay, so um, I have demonstrated so far that in 2014 to 2018, the local wind uh, forcing had a considerable impact on the variability of the upper ocean heat content and sea level, and uh, it altered the signals propagating from the eastern boundary. So signals at the eastern boundary are strongly linked to ANSO, and uh, uh, therefore, they are largely forced by processes in the equatorial Western Pacific. So now, now we want to quantify and analyze the combined and relative contributions of the eastern uh, boundary forcing and uh, the local wind stress curve to the interannual variability of uh, uh, the South Indian Ocean heat content and sea level and here we are using a linearized analytic 1.5 uh, layer reduced gravity model. So the large scale variability of sea level and heat content away from the equator is strongly influenced by Rossby waves. So in the South Indian Ocean, either Rossby waves eman emanate from the eastern boundary where they, they, their generation is modulated by uh, signals uh, coming from the Pacific, or they are uh, generated by local uh, wind forcing. Uh, the long wave linear vorticity equation governing uh, the paraclinic component of sea level anomaly can be expressed by uh, this equation, where eta is uh, the sea level anomaly, CR is the zonal phase speed of long paraclinic Rossby waves, tau is wind stress, and epsilon is a frictional damping transition. So the solution to this equation in the long GT time plane looks like this, where the local sea level results from the signals radiated from the eastern boundary and the signals generated by uh, wind stress either the same location or uh, further eastward. And here is the result. So uh, the plots uh, show the time longitude diagrams of sea level anomaly averaged between 10 and 30 south from satellite altimetry. This is the left plot. And uh, the right plot is the result from the reduced gravity model, which includes both the eastern boundary forcing and the local wind forcing. And we can see that the model does a pretty good job, actually. And most anomalies are well uh, reproduced. Now we can look at each individual forcing term. And in the next two plots, uh, you see the sea level that originates at the eastern boundary and, and the one that is forced by uh, local uh, wind over the South Indian Ocean. And both signals then propagate westward as Rossby uh, waves. And we can see that the local uh, wind stress curve dominates sea level variability in the western uh, in the western south indian ocean while uh, the eastern boundary forcing is dominant in the uh, eastern part of the basin so this is also clearly uh, shown by the time series of each uh, forcing component averaged over the western uh, part of the basin and the eastern part of the basin 
And so here, the altimeter sea level anomaly is showing by black curve. And the model sea level anomaly is showing by the green curves in both plots. The contributions by the eastern boundary forcing and uh, the local wind forcing are showing by the blue and the uh, red curves, uh, respectively. So with regard um, to the most recent changes in uh, sea level anomaly associated with 2000, 14 to 2016 linear event, we can see that uh, decrease of sea level during uh, this linear event was contributed by both um, the eastern boundary forcing and the local wind forcing was also important. Uh, the recovery, uh, the following recovery of uh, oceanic heat content and sea level, however, was mainly uh, due to wind forcing over the western part of the South Indian Ocean. Okay, so although this simple linear model that we just considered is uh, able to explain the majority of the observed sea level variations, uh, this model adopts certain uh, assumptions and, uh, and arbitrary parameters. And so in order to further investigate the interplay between uh, the remote and local forcing, mechanisms in driving sea level and heat content changes in the South Indian Ocean. We also employed uh, a global ocean and sea ice state estimate based on the MIT GCM and produced by the Estimating the Circulation and Climate of the Ocean Consortium, so this so-called ECHO, ECHO model. And uh, this estimate contains the full range of oceanic dynamical processes responsible for sea level variability, and it's based on the adjoint method to iteratively minimize the model data misfits and to adjust uh, the control parameters. Uh, the observational data used for the minimization include temperature salinity profiles, satellite altimetry and gravi gravimetry measurements, sea surface temperature and satellite observations of sea ice uh, concentration. So we used uh, an AD permitting version of uh, this model um, with uh, the horizontal grid spacing varying from 12 kilometers at high latitudes and 28 kilometers at mid latitudes. There are 50 uh, vertical uh, levels and uh, uh, so once the control parameters that include the initial temperature and salinity fields, mixing parameters and atmospheric boundary conditions are adjusted, then uh, the optimized echo solution is obtained by a forward unconstrained model integration. And in order to address the objectives of our investigation, we also performed a sensitivity experiment in which we physically isolated uh, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean by closing the Indonesian Straits and the Torres Strait between Australia and New, New, New Guinea. So thus, we artificially removed the ITF or the ocean tunnel influence on the Indian Ocean heat content. So in this experiment, any variability observed along the South Indian Ocean eastern boundary is primarily due to local uh, forcing by constructs. So in the following, in the following, the optimized uh, realistic model simulation is uh, referred to as the ITF form, and the experiment with the closed Indonesian passages is referred to as the ITF form. So the optimized ITF form simulation realistically simulates the oceanic variability uh, in the South Indian Ocean, and not, not only. And for example, here you can see the upper ocean ITF transport in the Makassar Strait from observations in uh, black and from the model in magenta. So the, you see that the agreement is pretty good and the correlation is 0 0.8. And there is a pronounced reduction of the upper ocean ITF transport in 2014 to 2016 in both uh, the ITF on experiment and in observations. And this is a response to the strong 2014-2016 uh, Alinea uh, one. So the closure, the closure of the ITF leads to a weakening of the South Equatorial uh, current and the Lyrian current. 
But if before, so before we compare uh, the results from the ITF-1 and ITF-4 experiments, it is important to discuss uh, the following issue. So equatorial Kelvin waves in the Indian Ocean can eventually get trapped along the Indonesian coast and partly propagate south. So the coastal trapped waves, they intrude into the Indonesian seas through uh, passages between the islands and uh, uh, so they then they penetrate the western pacific uh, without significantly affecting the dynamics along the australian coast so in our itf off experiment uh, so we place an artificial wall to close the indonesian passages and the Torres strait uh, so theoretically such a wall may permit waves that originated in the eastern equatorial indian ocean to follow the artificial coastline pass through the uh, Indonesian archipelago and reach the western uh, coast of Australia. And if this is the case, then closing the ITF will generate uh, spurious variability in the equatorial uh, South Indian Ocean. Excuse me, in the, in, in the mid latitude of South Indian Ocean. So in order to verify that the closure of the Indonesian passages does not generate spurious variability in the East and South Indian Ocean, uh, we conducted a cross-correlation analysis of daily sea level anomalies in the model at a number of, uh, of locations and uh, in both experiments. Actually. So these locations are shown in this map. And the analysis shows that coastal trapped waves do propagate along uh, along the Indonesian and West Australia coast. However, you do not see any coherent wave, wave propagation from, from the equator uh, to the West Australia coast, neither in the ATF-1 nor in the ATF-4 experiment. So in both experiments, uh, the waves that originate in the equatorial region uh, are traceable all the way, all the way to the point uh, I'm not sure if you see the numbers, but it's 0.4, it's close to Timor Islands. Uh, after which they probably dissipate. And uh, the waves that reach the West Australia coast here, they originate from uh, the northern coast of Australia. But they are unlikely to be related, they're not related to signals uh, near uh, the wall uh, place between, the, between Australia and uh, New Guinea. So this means that this wall doesn't actually lead to a spurious variability in, in the eastern uh, South Indian Ocean so that we can compare the two experiments and uh, see how, how the closure of the ITF affects the oceanic heat content in the South Indian Ocean. Okay, so now let's compare the results from the two experiments. And here you see the time series of sea level anomaly from altimetry in, uh, in red. And from the numerical experiments, ITF-1 in uh, solid black and ITF-4 in uh, dashed black. And these are the time series averaged over uh, several regions. So namely the entire box a here and then its subdivisions boxes b c and d and uh, so uh first we first of all we see that the itf one runs realistically simulates sea level anomaly in the south indian ocean uh second uh, in the itf off run we do not see the decade long increase uh, of sea level and ocean heat content um, so this suggests that ocean tunnel effect was uh, was responsible for this increase. Also, the ocean tunnel effect was partly responsible for the decrease of sea level in 2014-2016. On the other hand, uh, we see that the closure of the ITF mainly affected box uh, D, which is mid latitudes actually. In farther north, boxes B and C the closure of the ITF had a smaller impact on sea level variability. So we also performed a new app analysis um, of both the ITF on and the ITF off uh, sea level fields. And here I'm showing uh, the first EOF mode and associated uh, wind uh, patterns. 
And we can see that both experiments exhibit similar spatial uh, patterns, which represent a dipole structure with a positive anomaly um, over the central and western uh, tropical Indian Ocean and a negative anomaly along the eastern boundary and around the maritime continent. So the leading EOF mode is linked to ANSO, associated with changes in trade and equatorial winds. And the spatial variability patterns in the ITF-1 and ITF-4 experiment are similar, which means that they are mostly determined by local processes and they are not related to ocean tunnel effect. In the lower plots, I'm showing the percentage of local variance explained by the leading EOF mode in both experiments. And we see that while the experiments display very similar large scale patterns also, the EOF1 for the ITF1 simulation is responsible for somewhat greater variance explained along the eastern boundary. All right, so similar uh, to what we did with observations, we also assessed the combined and relative contributions of the eastern uh, boundary forcing and the local wind stress flow uh, to the interannual variability of sea level in, in the South Indian Ocean using the linear reduced gravity model, uh, which was applied to both the ITF-1 and the ITF-4 experiments. And the results are shown here by the time longitude diagrams and the time series uh, of sea level and each individual uh, forcing component of two latitudes. So it's 13 south and 25 south and for, for the time series. And so I'm not going to get into uh, details, but uh, uh, the main takeaway messages from these plots are as follows. So that first, the propagating sea level anomaly patterns in both experiments are quite similar in particular at 13 uh, south. Then the eastern boundary forcing, which is largely linked to the ocean tunnel effect, dominates the simulated sea level anomaly variability in the eastern South Indian Ocean in both experiments. Uh, so wind forcing is dominant in the western South Indian Ocean around 13 south. Uh, farther south, at 25 uh, uh, south in the western South Indian Ocean, while wind forcing explains shorter term year to year fluctuations, the amplitudes of the two forcing components are quite similar, meaning that their contribution to the sea surface height variability is uh, comparable. There. Okay, so this is my summary and conclusions. So uh, we investigated the interplay, uh, so the in interannual to decadal variability of sea level and heat content in the South Indian Ocean um, is determined actually by the complex interplay between the mechanisms of remote uh, and local origin, the remote being the Pacific influence and the local is the wind forcing over the South Indian Ocean. And uh, so both are linked to and so via the ocean tunnel and atmospheric breach effects. Signals of Pacific origin that originate from the eastern boundary uh, dominate the interannual variability of sea level heat content in the eastern South Indian Ocean, and the local wind forcing is dominant in the western South Indian Ocean. So the spatial pattern uh, of sea level and ocean heat content change in the South Indian Ocean is mostly determined by local wind forcing, as was demonstrated by numerical experiment. And is largely linked to and so via the atmospheric breach effect. The ocean tunnel effect is uh, responsible for the decade long increase of sea level and heat content in 2004 2013, and partly also for the uh, decrease during the most recent. Uh, so, the different oceanic responses to the two strongest on record El Nino events in 1997, 1990. Eight and in 2014-2016 can be explained by different wind forcing patterns associated with positive IOD in 1997 and the negative, strongly negative IOD in 2016. And this, this so these uh, uh, patterns they respectively inhibit and favor the formation of basin uh, wide cyclonic wind anomaly in the South Indian Ocean. 
So thank you very much for your attention and I welcome your questions.